Consejo de Seguridad de la UNE, atendiendo a la petición contenida en la carta de fecha 8 de octubre de 1996, dirigida al secretario general por los representantes de la Federación de Rusia, Kazajstán, Kirguistán, Tayikistán y Uzbekistán ante las Naciones Unidas, documento S barra 1996 barra 838. Me permito señalar a la atención de los miembros del Consejo los siguientes documentos. S barra 1996 barra 810, nota verbal de fecha 30 de septiembre de 1996, dirigida al secretario general por la misión permanente de Kazajstán ante las Naciones Unidas y documento S barra 1996 barra 842, carta de fecha 9 de octubre de 1996, dirigida al presidente del Consejo de Seguridad por el viceministro de Relaciones Exteriores del Afganistán. El primer orador inscrito en mi lista es el distinguido viceministro de Relaciones Exteriores del Afganistán, excelentísimo señor Abdur Rahim Gaforsay, a quien doy la palabra. En el nombre de Dios, most gracious, most merciful. Mr. President, allow me to embark upon the onset. On behalf of the Islamic State of Afghanistan, the expression of my appreciation to you and the distinguished members of the Security Council for the convening of this meeting, which beyond any doubt is reflective of a deep international concern over the heartbreaking situation in our homeland, the root of which is embedded in foreign intervention. Let me particularly thank the distinguished delegations of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, the Russian Federation, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan for asking for the convening of this meeting. Mr. President, four consecutive years have passed since our neighbor, Pakistan, is acting as an obstacle to the return of peace and normalcy to our war-shattered homeland. Through a series of conspiracies and schemes. It is because of this, Mr. President, that our nation is turning towards this Council. Our nation is turning this way because the Security Council is the highest source of hope for peoples oppressed, occupied, and invaded. The Council is burdened with the responsibility and the task of preservation of peace and security, regional and international. It is natural for us to voice our objection whenever we want to rid ourselves of our responsibility as concerned members of this global family when we see peace and stability endangered. Though in a remote corner of the globe, life and prosperity of a nation jeopardized through a multifaceted and multipolar conspiracy orchestrated by military industrial magnets from abroad. That is the case of Afghanistan today. Mr. President, what is expected of this Council is to judge the events as required by the United Nations Charter and recognized principles of international law and to take appropriate measures. Otherwise, remaining silent towards open and naked aggression and deviation from principles, which 51 years ago earned the commitment of many nations, would be a blow to the essence of the United Nations ideals. I'm confident that everyone here shares these views. Negligence towards these blatant encroachments and violations of human rights of the people of Afghanistan will take us to an era when the motto 
of might is right ruled. An era when the cry of oppressed nations was not catered for. And an era when the strongest and the richest decided alone on the future of the planet. Mr. President, allow me once again to refer to the main cause of continued conflict in Afghanistan, a cause which unfortunately the United Nations could not effectively challenge. For the past three years, delegations of the Islamic State of Afghanistan have complained about the continuation of foreign intervention on the level of the United Nations General Assembly and of the Security Council. Today, that is still the case. Unfortunately, the measures taken by the United Nations have been limited to only adoption of resolutions and issuance of statements. The situation encouraged the aggressor to take further measures for the realization of the objective to recruit, train, equip, and send mercenaries called the Taliban into the territory of Afghanistan. We raised our complaints and objections against measures taken by Pakistani military intelligence in the scheme crafted by Nasirullah Babur, the Pakistani interior minister, who has been referred to as the commander of the Taliban by Ejaz ul Haq, member of Pakistani parliament, and also the son of the late General Zia ul Haq. Through a number of statements and official letters, all published as documents of the General Assembly and of the Security Council, we brought this to the attention of the President of the Security Council. In the meeting of December 1995, we introduced the names of some Pakistani military personnel which were in the custody of the Islamic State of Afghanistan. On September 26, 1996, the pilot of a plane carrying Taliban from Herat to Peshawar landed in Bagram, the government air base, and expressed how he was fed up with taking orders from Pakistani officers. Among the 31 passengers aboard the plane, including 26 Taliban, five were Pakistani officers. Pakistani officials first dismissed the news. Later, they claimed that five to be Pakistani religious scholars. Just two days ago, on October 14, 96, Monica Whitlock, the BBC Central Asian correspondent, traveled to the north of Kabul and saw captured Pakistani militias and officers. The names of a few of them are as follows. One, Muhammad Jawed, son of Muhammad Israr, 25 years old, from Multan, Pakistan. Two, Khalid, son of Nasrullah, 23 years old, from Karachi, Pakistan. Three, Abdul Rahman, son of Shamsuddin, 23 years old, from Kashmir. Four, Ubaidullah Shaheen, son of Aladina, 26 years old, from Multan, Pakistan. Five, Karimullah, son of Muhammad Rafiq, 29 years old, from Punjab, Pakistan. Six, Ubaidullah, son of Muhammad Zahir, 22 years old, from Punjab, Pakistan. Seven, Muhammad Omar Ahmad, son of Ahmad, 32 years old, from Karachi, Pakistan. Eight, Hassan, son of Abdullah, 30 years old, from Punjab, Pakistan. The Islamic State of Afghanistan will soon present to the Security Council videotapes of these and many, and many other Pakistani captives in the custody of its authorities. Mr. President, for those looking for independent witness on the active participation of Pakistani fighters among the Taliban, let me quote the new report, dated 9th of October 96, by Lauren Hamida of Reuters News Agency, who says, and I quote, warriors were scowling mountainsides at Qalatak in Salang Valley, speaking good English and saying they were from Pakistani city of Karachi. They expelled reporters who had reached there, quote, get out of here or we'll kill you, yield one of them, unquote. The role of the Pakistani circles in sponsoring the Taliban mercenaries, a role which was already an open secret, became a subject of a well-declared confession when Her Excellency Mohtarama Benazir Bhutto, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, admitted during an interview 
with the BBC, the Pakistani involvement in Taliban. The extravagant statements of Nasirullah Babur about the imminent fall of Panjshir Valley a few days ago proved to be wishful thinking and a clear evidence of the Pakistani official intervention in the Afghan affairs. He has already considered Kabul as an annex to Pakistan by paying a visit to Kabul on October 15, 96, just yesterday, amidst consecutive Taliban defeats due to popular uprising. Despite the above, officials of the United Nations did not take steps needed against these Pakistani military intelligence circles. Later, during the successive Taliban defeats in areas south and east of Kabul, foreign militias joined Taliban ranks. We captured some of these militias, red-handedly fighting in the front lines. And as we have mentioned last year, 23 members of these militias were taken by, by His Highness Prince Turki Al Faisal, the Saudi Arabian security minister, to Pakistan as an act of Afghan go goodwill gesture. When the issue of foreign intervention was raised again, high authorities of the United Nations repeated the familiar line of no hard core evidence. We presented a list of the militias through the General Assembly. Once again, it did not enjoy the satisfaction of the UN officials. The Security Council did not condemn the aggressor. At times, some UN authorities have in turned a blind eye to the true identity of the Taliban, their legacy, and massive human rights violations labeled the Taliban as a, quote, positive element for peace in Afghanistan, unquote. On September 5, 1995, the city of Herat, under the administration of Commander Ismail Khan, once referred to as the best model of a sound administration by Mahmoud Mistiri, was overrun by the Taliban through direct assistance and involvement of Pakistani militia. Let us refer to the meeting of the Security Council, document S-1995-767, in which we presented good reasons for accusing Pakistani military intelligence circles in that onslaught. For many weeks following the fall of Herat, all heavy weapons, depots, and supplies belonging to Afghanistan were being shipped to Kuwait, Pakistan. We asked the Security Council to put an end to the state-sponsored unlawful shipment of Afghan property by Pakistan. Unfortunately, our request for sending a United Nations fact-finding mission to Herat remained unanswered. Our plight went unheard, and the Pakistani circles felt being encouraged. Then, the eastern city of Jalalabad, headquarters of United Nations and international organizations center of inter-Afghan dialogue and an impartial city to the conflict became the target of Pakistani military intelligence on September 11, 1996, where the Taliban turned the peace and security into terror and instability. The United Nations Secretariat looked at the latest development through a tinted lens and once again disregarded foreign intervention. The UN considered it as an internal development and watched the Taliban move on Kabul. Mr. President, in our statement before the Security Council on April 9, 96, we suggested the establishment of a UN monitoring post along the southern border point of Spinboldak between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Pakistani assistance in terms of military, personnel, and armament would not have easily reached the Taliban had the Council paid adequate attention to our suggestion. September 27, Taliban, <coughs> accompanied by Pakistani military officers and militia forces, invaded the capital. Much blood was shed. In the division of Kabul, the Taliban were found to even have used chemical or some type of internationally prohibited weapons, as we brought to the attention of the Security Council document A-1996-842, October 10, 1996. And in three weeks, since the takeover of Kabul, the Taliban, termed once as a positive element for peace by the UN officials, committed acts 
which earned the condemnation of Amnesty International.